be it for delivery, be it for assembly, what have you, you want them to go to a specific target. <clears throat> so the question is, you know, what is the what are the best design parameters to do all of this? Um, can you get by with a motor that has no symmetry and move them direction? Now, first glance you'd say, well, that's going to be really, really difficult. But you can have asymmetry in the uh, shape of the motor, uh, but there are other ways of generating asymmetry. And the one I like is best is asymmetry in the information gradient. We talked about chemical gradient and, and light gradient and so on. So if you had a spherical object and that you can power, and I'll explain what I mean by power. But if you had a spherical object which you, which you can move, uh, but it's symmetrical, so it has no sense of direction. But if you then impose a gradient, a chemical gradient or a light gradient, would it move up the gradient? Uh, or would it move down the gradient? Uh, you, you think that it would move in a directional manner. And my question is, uh, would it move up or down the gradient? Now this, this has to do with bacteria chemotaxis uh, too. So the way bacteria chemotaxis is that bacteria um, spend some of their time doing straight runs. So they're just swimming in a straight line. And some of the time tumbling. <clears throat> uh, and so you can sort of say tumbling is like Rami and B or intention. And so what happens is that if there is a gradient of food, what it does, it does more of the straight runs than tumble. And that's how it keeps going. So the way it does is, let's say it starts from a point, and it does a straight run. And then senses what the gradient is here compared to where it started. If the gradient is higher here, life is good, you just keep going. If the gradient is lower and not that different, then it does a tumble. And it reorients itself. And then it goes some direction and does this. So what that requires is temporal memory. You need to know what the gradient was at point A and what the gradient is now that you've gone to point B. Uh, that's great. Bacteria can do it. Our stupid motors have no memory. Actually, we would love to have memory. But we don't, at the moment, have a memory. <clears throat> so, so remember what happens in bacteria is that when they are moving in response to a gradient, the ratio of straight run to tumbling increases. The speed doesn't increase. The, the speed of the straight runs don't increase, as far as I know. It's just the ratio of straight runs to tumbling changes. Now, think about particles. And let's, let's start with a simple one, rock. Uh, and, for example, the dog that we talked about yesterday. Now, we know that the speed increases when the gradient or the concentration of food is higher. And so, uh, as they will move faster and faster as, uh, as the gradient increases. Uh, every so often, as you saw, you know, brownian tumbling patterns, and they reorient themselves and so on. And so every so often they'll get reoriented. But the point is that they're, if they're moving towards the target, they're speeding up. And if they're moving away from the target, um, they would slow down. And so you would, one argument is that therefore um, they should stochastically move closer and closer to the food. Okay? <clears throat> that would be a smart one. That's fine. So that's one argument. The other argument is they will do exactly the opposite, <laughs> which is that. They're moving in the wrong direction to slow down, and once 
office will go down, they're kind of stuck. And so, so they will end up away from the field rather than towards the field. Um, so the difference, by the way, between bacteria and them is in bacteria, <coughs> the ratio of straight run to tumble uh, increases, the speed doesn't change. In the case of these motors, then, it's not the ratio that changes. It's the speed that changes. Because higher the food or fuel concentration, the faster they move. So, so if I give you that, that you have particles that move around uh, and they move faster uh, when the fuel concentration or food concentration is higher and they move slower when the concentration goes down and you impose a gradient, which way will they move? Will they move up the gradient or down the gradient? And I can't get a straight answer from anyone. And so I figure you have an evening to work it out. <laughs> yes? Is the domain finite or infinite? Uh, well, the way we do our experiment, it's obviously finite. But uh, I don't know. Do it any way you want. I just want to know what the answer is. <laughs> it, it, it changes. <laughs> The particles are of order nanometer, and what's the domain size? Oh, okay. So, okay. So let's 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 say that you got. We'll just come up with some arbitrary dimensions, okay? So let's say you got 50 micron long, right? And you start your so your food sources here. So as you go away, the concentration of food decreases, right? Because it's leaching out from this source. This is your McDonald's. So it's leaching out from this. Source. Okay. And the particles, closer they are to the target, the faster they move around. Okay? And I'm not presupposing any directionality. All I'm saying is that they're just moving around faster. It's really brown. The question is, stochastically, will they move up or will they move down? <coughs> and um, so I don't know how to solve, to solve it, obviously. but. I, mean, I can do the experiment, I'll tell you what the experiment results are. Yes? Isn't it obviously going to end up where there's no food because it's going to just pass through the region where there is food until it hits the wall and then it's going to just keep traveling and eventually it's going to get stuck where there's no food? Uh, no, the, so, so the closest thing I can, I can see in the literature is thermophoresis. Um, so thermophoresis is where it's hotter, the diffusion is higher than when it's, where it's colder, right? So if you impose a thermal gradient, okay, it's essentially the same thing. Where it's hotter, it's moving faster, and when it's colder, it's moving more slowly. And the question is, where are they going to all going to end up? In the hottest part or the coldest part? Um, so you can look at the uh, literature on that. And the answer is both. Uh, some of, most of them tend to end up in the colder regions. Some of them end up in the warmer region. And I try to understand why. I keep talking about the interactions. Um, so, so, so the interaction between the fuel molecules and the motors is important. Uh, so you can make whatever assumption you want. Tell me what the assumptions are, and then we can try to kind of see whether that works. So th there was something on the slide yesterday I found curious. You showed the rotational diffusion of yeah. rods as a function of speed. And if I remember, <coughs> you seem to be saying that the rod was moving faster. It actually had a smaller rotational diffusion. No, no. The one you saw was if you didn't give it food or fuel, they had a certain rotational diffusion. And then these are the magnetized rods, and then if you gave them fuel but no magnetic field, then the rotational diffusion went up because they're just running crazy and they're just moving, moving all around the place. But then when you apply the magnetic field, then you dampen it. Well, I mean, you have this directionality factor plot, right? That that wasn't with Which any one? externally applied field. The directionality factor. Yeah, but that's that's over a point two second thing. That's cheating. Okay. Look, I, I can also move them using a magnetic field as a demonstrator. To me, that's cheating. I want to move them with chemistry. I'm a chemist. I don't want magnetic fields. I want to do it with chemistry. And so I want to know what is the best way to do this. 
So, get off your spherical columns and <coughs> tell me how to do this. So we talked about it more tomorrow. Um, so, <coughs> By the way, I think I had 130 some slides. And every time I talk to you guys, I go back and add a few more. So I'm up to 170. So you will excuse me if some of them are missing from your notes. Anyway, the mechanism, one of the mechanisms we talked about yesterday uh, was this uh, a redox and bipolar redox reaction where you have oxidation at one end and reduction at the other end, and you have electron flow across the metal and uh, ion flow, in this case proton flow, on the outside, which drags water or whatever fluid you might have. So you have a fluid flow going this direction and the motor going the other direction. And if you uh, stop the motor from moving, then it will uh, pump fluid. Uh, and, and then I saw an unused uh, poster yesterday um, and, uh, mm -hmm. where he proposed an interesting, interesting way of pumping things. Uh, and it turns out actually the experimenters have done something very similar. And uh, so I, I just want to see a little bit about that. And so what they did was they took a membrane porous membrane, and they, they deposited platinum on one end, uh, on one side, and gold on the other side. <coughs> now, if you remember uh, oops, uh, from a description of fluid flow, uh, that it involves electron movement from one metal to the other. Uh, and the uh, electroosmotic flow of the fluid as a result. Uh, and so um, this thing cannot work if you have one metal here and the other metal here and there's no contact between the two metals. Uh, and so what they did was then they had an external way of contacting the two metals. Uh, and here is their plot. Every time they would contact the two metals, so, the, so you have hydrogen peroxide inside, so you can do this redox reaction, oxidation with platinum side, reduction with gold side, and, but it'll only happen if the two metals are in contact, and so every time you turn the contact on, it pumps. If you switch it off, uh, it stops pumping. Okay. So here's a way of regulating pumping through this membrane <coughs> uh, using this catalytic process. Um, and you can see that there's, you know, there, there's an appreciable flow uh, through these, these membranes. So, so there are uh, interesting ways to apply this. Uh, but enough about this, this mechanism. Um, <coughs> by the way, before I finish this section, so I came across this blog where they named all these motors. So let's see, this, the, the first motor was George Whitesides' motor. He took uh, a millimeter side silica discs and put, put platinum radars on one side, rudders, sorry, rudders on one side, and hydrogen peroxide and bubbles to cause them to move. They're called Carl Benz, since they were the first. Um, then, I'm going to and then the one that we talked about, it's called a Ford Mustang. It's a hot rod, get it? <laughs> um, and then there is this, uh, this one, <coughs> uh, which is the Golestinian uh, motor, which is silica with a piece of platinum on one side, it also moves by 
generating neutral molecules, IUO2, it's much slower than the Volkswagen Beetle. Mm -hmm. I have nothing to do with the water. Is it round? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's round too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we talked about this one, the, uh, the carbon fiber that moves oxygen breathing water that we talked about yesterday. So it's called a Komatsu truck because it's huge. Remember these are millimeter sized carbon, uh, carbon fibers. <laughs> um, here's another one that involves catalase. F-150 has exhaust issues because oxygen starts coming out. So on, so forth. This, is, this is the other one with carbon <coughs> nanotubes inside, which was much faster. So it's four, four mass plus time GT now. So it's more kick and so on. Anyway. Okay. So this. Okay, so I've, I've talked about uh, one of the ways um, to power particle motion and fluid flow, which is this bipolar electrochemical uh, reaction process. Now, one of the other things we're in interested in is to have these motors talk to each other. And it wasn't clear to us how you do it through the mechanism that we just discussed yesterday. And so we needed other ways of moving these things so that they can talk to each other. And so that's what I want to talk about uh, today. So how you move things using um, other mechanisms and how you direct them using a chemical gradient, i.e. chemotaxis. So these would be uh, you know, some of the first examples of chemotaxis outside biology uh, and how you have them uh, have them talk, uh, talk to each other. So our inspiration here are the quorum sensing uh, bacteria. Um, how many of you are familiar with quorum sensing bacteria? Okay. So uh, for those who haven't heard the term, um, so if you if, if you get infected by bacteria, you don't immediately fall sick. You know, there's a, there's a period, a week or so, before you start to feel sick. Uh, so what's happening during that time? Well, the, the bugs know, if there are just a few of them, um, if they launch an attack, your immune system is going to slaughter them. And so they lie in wait to reproduce. And when there are enough of them, then they launch an attack. Now the question is, how do they know that there are enough of them? Can bacteria count? Uh, and the answer is basically yes. So how do they count? Well, they count by each of them will emit um, a chemical. Uh, and they monitor the chemical level in the surrounding. And it, when it reaches a certain threshold value, they know we're, we're enough. There are enough of us around, and let's, let's attack this to a um, There are many other organisms that do this. Slime mold is a good example. Um, there's solitary amoebas that move around, uh, except when they run short of food and then they get panicky, they will die. Uh, so they send out these chemicals and they monitor that. And they all come together up this chemical gradient of the scent. Put together and then they reproduce and so on. So, so that's going to be our inspiration. Okay? That's what we want to do. So, We'll have these guys uh, secrete ions. Um, so this is going to be a new mechanism of movement also. Um, so if you have a particle and it forms cations and anions, uh, and if let's say one of them is smaller than the other, let's say the cation is smaller than the anion, and the cation will diffuse faster than the anion. So on the average, of course they're not going to be very far away from each other, but on the average the cation will diffuse a little bit faster than the anion. That sets up an electric field. 
and the particle, and if almost all particles are charged, uh, will sense that electric field and will move. So that's, uh, so that's the uh, uh, general idea. Uh, so ions will be secreted, uh, these ions will diffuse, and the bots will respond to this electric field. The operating equation, since it's some school of physics, I have to have at least one equation, so this is it. Guys. Uh, so this, this is the speed, and the speed depends on the difference in mobility between the cation and the anion. It depends on the gradient of the ions, and it depends on the charge of the particle, the zeta potential of the particle, and if the particle is close to a wall, it depends on the zeta potential of the wall. The particle is not close to the wall. So it depends on the difference in diffusion coefficient of the gamma and the ion and, and the gradient. Um, and since uh, <coughs> uh, you are in the low Reynolds number rate the regime, the mass and the size of the particles are not very So that's the idea. You need discrete ions for electric field. Uh, the bots will move, but if you have a high enough concentration of them, then the fields are going to overlap. And then you should start to see collective behavior. So that's, that's, that's the idea. So to show this, uh, the first thing we did was chemistry that's at least 100 years old. Um, this is black and white photography. You use silver salts for black and white photography. You shine light on them, you make silver. If you do it in water, you also make protons and chloride ions. And of course, protons are much smaller than chloride ions and diffuse much faster. And so if you have a silver chloride particle and you shine light on it, you're going to make protons and chloride ions. The protons are going to diffuse faster than the chloride ions. So you will have an electric field that will be pointed this way, as shown. And if, if this is negatively charged, and they are, then they will tend to move <coughs> that way. So here are some silver chloride particles. The light will come on, and then start to move like crazy. This is just water, silver chloride, nothing else. And they just start moving like crazy. So that's good. But then they start to swarm and form schools. <coughs> So you can see that there's one that's, that's forming here, there's another one forming there. <coughs> and by the way, this, this is not Oswald ripening. They're not far, coming together and agglomerating. This is, they're not sticking to each other. And so in about 90 seconds, you go from here uh, to there. <coughs> and this is supposed to be a simulation of this. Put it in codes and explain why it's in codes. And this is um, just a computer simulation. Here are the particles, and white and green are the gradients formed. White is high gradient, green is uh, lower gradient. And over time, you can see these particles come, come together. I call this quote unquote simulation. This is not a simulation of this, this is a simulation for slime molds. So you can see that they are very similar to what, what these living organisms will do in terms of forum, forum sensing. You can use this program actually to simulate it. Um, what you do is uh, you start off with some concentration of chemicals uh, and then more are produced at a site. And of course the neighboring sites are also producing these chemicals or ions and they're diffusing it to this site losing some to the bulk. Uh, and, and, and so you can, um, you can model this. You think about the chemical gradient across these lattice sites. And you assign a probability of hopping. And so we did this with NetLogo, which is just a simple computer model that you can download from the web. Uh, and it works actually perfectly fine. It's, uh, it's initially they're randomly distributed. Uh, and then they start to collect. And these are the gradients again. White is high, green is low, uh, low green. Uh, 
and uh, it, it essentially projects what you what you would expect. Uh, so proportion of particles in a school uh, goes up uh, as the sensitivity of the gradient goes up. So you can dial these knobs. Um, it goes up as the uh, decomposition rate or secretion rate goes up. Um, it goes down if, if the chemical is rapidly diffusing away from the particles into the bulk, as you might expect. And finally, the higher the particle density, uh, more swarming uh, uh, you see. So, um, so it's just a computer simulation that is not, not really in the heart of theory and it works just fine. But you have to have fun, right? So, um, what if you had two different kinds of particles? And the first particle uh, secretes these chemicals, ions, in our case. But both particles are charged, right? All particles are charged. So the second particle, which is the inactive one, can obviously sense the secretion for the first one. So you can smell that first one, right? And so then it says, okay, fine, that seems to be my prey. And I'm just going to go up to that guy and surround it. And so in the next video, you just have a few silver chloride particles. And these are dark in color, and the rest are just silica particles. Nothing special. <coughs> So these are the silver chloride particles, these are silica, the light comes on, these guys start to move, and watch the silica particles. This one actually tries to escape. Gets, gets caught. So it's, it's a predator prey situation. Um, <coughs> One thing you've noticed that, that these, the, the wolf pack that surrounds the deer, surrounds it, it there, there is a, it doesn't actually touch it. And there's a reason for it. Um, I'll let you figure out what the reason is. We can talk about it. So, uh, now in this case, we, yes. Uh, have you ever visualized what the velocity field is when you have one to see the particle? Yeah, we have, we have actually been doing some uh, doing some tracking uh, and looking at uh, ballistic versus diffusion versus subdiffusion uh, movement of these particles. So individually, the silver chloride particles exhibit uh, ballistic motion. When you have a few neighbors, then it drops down the diffusion because you have, I guess, the neighbors induce more rotations. Uh, and then when they're caught in a school, they're very subdiffusive. But we haven't totally finished that kind of stuff. Now, uh, in this case, by the way, they're emitting protons and chloride ions. Protons are smaller. They're moving out faster. Uh, and so they're behaving one way, i.e. they're surrounding the thing. You can reverse the whole process. So if you pick something where the anion moves faster than the cation, you can reverse the process. So instead of attractive, you can have a repulsive interaction. Uh, so the next video is what I call a shark attacking a school of fish. <laughs> <coughs> so, uh, in this case, it's magnesium hydroxide, it's giving on magnesium ions and hydroxide ions, hydroxide ions, the anions, and move faster than the magnesium ions. <coughs> so, uh, so you can do it uh, in an attractive way or a repulsive way. What's the scale of the picture? Uh, so, these particles are about a micron to two microns. So, yes, it's very large. So it's there's a question in there. If you Why did it asked, stop at the end? What? Why did it stop at the end? I mean, it was it was attacking the school of fish, as you call it, and then it stopped in the middle, and it started rotating around. So, 
Yeah, I don't know the answer to it. But this, um, this one we haven't studied in detail, but um, so your question is why, why did this guy stop? Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't know the answer. Yeah, so because there's obviously still more stuff uh, that we've done out of it. Maybe it's just thought it catches and it's just relating to this. There's one where he stopped with the patient. What? <laughs> there's one very stubborn fish in front of him. <laughs> <laughs> so you can uh, and then you can have uh, uh, micro fireworks where you switch the light on and off. But before that, let me just tell you, so what we have is, is sort of new design principles where you can have two or more different particles that can move autonomously to organize themselves in a spatial manner. So you can have particle A, so on you have particle B, so on you have particle C, and so on. Uh, and you don't have to do anything special. You just have to give them fuel to do it. Um, and remember all the trouble we took to move cargo by trying to attach them and then move them? We don't need to attach them. We just need the first particle dangling a carrot. And the second particle will follow it. Uh, so if we then move the first particle to a specific place, the second set of particles will move there also. So, we can, so in principle, it can be done. So that's a potential solution. We haven't tried it out. Uh, fireworks. So you just have an ensemble of silicon particles, and you switch them on and off. switch the light on and off. Uh, you see flashes when the light comes on and off. <coughs> and it also shows that they're not agglomerating; they're not sticking to each other. They're very close to each other, but they don't stick. There's always a distance. What you can do is call it there if you want. Okay? So, told you half a story with these things, but <coughs> the story I told you is this. That when you hit silver chloride with light, you make silver, uh, and you make protons and chloride ions, Protons move faster than the chloride ions, so they move away faster, so the E field is directed this way. Now, if you add an oxidant to the solution, and you use hydrogen peroxide, but you can use other ones from manganese and so on, what happens is you can reform the silver chloride. And to reform it, it consumes protons and chlorides, so and now protons and chlorides are diffuse in, and again, proton moves faster than the chloride ion. So the E field gets reversed. And so if you also have an oxidant present, uh, we get into an oscillatory trial behavior. And that's not necessarily given, but we're just lucky enough to go into it. And so the, these particles, remember the uh, silver chloride and the silica particles, and it was attractive. In this case, it alternates between attractive and repulsive. So look at the silver chloride. Okay gets stuck with the silica for a while, and then he decides, I hate you, and goes around, sticks again for a while, and then gets bored, and just leaves him. And you can see the other one, they do the same thing. Um, and, and it's not really just particles, you can also do it on lithographically, um, put in patterns, um, so you can have similar features on a flat surface, and you can add these reagents of the oxidant and the light, and they switch between one to the other. So silver, silver chloride, one of them is darker than the other, and you can see the switch. So, so you see them, they go light and dark. If you missed it, I have this video slowed down 10 times. Let's 
methods. You can kind of address them one at a time uh, in this fashion. And it's a redox reaction. Remember, you're, you're reducing the silver, oxidizing it, reducing it, oxidizing it. So if you connect a piece of wire to this, one of these features, you can actually measure the current. Uh, and the current is going up and down, up and down, up and down. <clears throat> so, so it looks like uh, the mechanism that I suggest. Uh, and then we get into these things, which I have no idea. So this is just a collection of silver fluoride uh, with some oxidant, and the light is constantly on. And they go back and forth. forming clusters, breaking apart, forming clusters, breaking apart, and so on and on. I don't even know how to do all of this stuff. Okay. And, and this, this phenomenon is actually quite general. So, uh, for example, this is, this is gold and hydrogen peroxide. Nothing much happens. Gold doesn't react with hydrogen peroxide. Let me just brief things at first. Um, so if you take gold particles, gold particles by themselves do nothing with hydrogen peroxide. So they just stand to stick around. You add a little bit of hydrogen, and you have a reaction where ions are formed. Uh, and then you start to see the swarming behavior. So you'll see the hydrogen peroxide added, there's going to be some shaking. And then not the, <coughs> sorry, the hydrogen being added. The hydrogen is now added and they start to swarm. And form little colonies. <clears throat> and in this case, eventually, if you, have a, if you have a very little amount of hydrogen, eventually you run out of it, and then they'll disperse again. So it's again a reversible swarming phenomenon. <clears throat> Here's another example that we published stacking in that. Okay, nothing special. Yes? Can I just ask you, so these both particles, when they come together, what prevents them from just simply? Ah, so this, it, it gets back to the same question uh, as why don't these particles agglomerate? Why is there always a distance between them? And it has to do with. When you have ions, gradients, you have these electroosmotic flows. And that happens on the surface of your glass slide, on which these, you're watching these things. But they also happen along the surface of these particles. Because all particles are charged and have double layers. So there's always a flow going around these double layers, which prevents them from coming together and sticking. I see, so these both particles are charge stabilized. They're not stabilized, they're inherently. All metals have, have a negative zeta potential. It's not much, it's about minus 20 millivolts. Uh, but all metals have a negative zeta potential. Silica is negative, negative zeta potential. So most of these things have negative zeta potential. Uh, no, we don't, we don't stabilize them in any way. <laughs> Uh, and this is, uh, this is silica titania Janus particles. They do the same thing on and off. Um, <clears throat> when you turn them on, uh, in this case, they move out. Uh, and when you turn them off, they move in. Uh, and uh, you can follow this. So this is when the UV light is being turned on, and you can see this oscillatory behavior. Uh, <clears throat> and so, as long as you have some bottom line, as long as you have particles that will decompose and form ions in solution or cause ions to form in solution, you're going to see this. You're going to see this kind of collective behavior. And you need a certain amount of density of these particles uh, so that the uh, gradients overlap. But once you have that, it's pretty general. Uh, and you can then start to uh, mimic some of the things you see in biology. Like I said, uh, in some ways these are more controlled. You don't feed them constantly. They don't die on you. Uh, so, things are good. Uh, so, talk about.
about these things, how you move things to catalysis, load them up, how do you do chemotaxis, up, up and down gradients. Uh, I'll, I'll talk more about these things again. But in case you think all of this is totally academic, uh, and money, there's no money to be made with all this crap. Uh, let me tell you, think again. So, uh, a couple of years ago, a group of consortium oil companies came to us and said, we'll give you lots of money. Just have your nanobots go find oil for us. <laughs> so here's the problem. The problem is that when an oil field is declared dry, they can't extract any oil from it, they have only extracted in 30 and 40 percent of the oil in there. 60 to 70 percent of the oil is still in there. What's the problem? The oil is caught in nano and micro channels. And they're held there by capillary forces. Uh, and it's not easy to get them up. So what they do is they pump water. They pump thousands and thousands of gallons of water into these wells, hoping to push the oil up. It doesn't work. Pressure-driven flow doesn't work in nano and micro channels very well, because it depends on the square of the diameter of the channel. And besides, the water finds its own path of least resistance. So they want to know where the oil is. And then maybe we can deliver something there, or at least tell them where the oil is. Um, so that was the idea. So we, uh, one afternoon, we drew this cartoon and gave us some money. <laughs> the, the idea was, well, we'll so they, they're pumping water anyway. So we're going to pump this nanobots in, OK? And with some stuff on them. And then we run around and find where the oil water interface is. They will congregate there uh, and then report back this is where the oil is. Okay. Uh, and the reason you need active particles is because you just send any old particle, which is going the flow of the water. Yes? But is the problem to where is the oil, or is the problem how do we get? The well, the, they don't. Have, they, the don't they don't. They don't either one of those. They don't have either one of those information. In terms of, I mean, it's just incredible what little they know. So what they do is, so drilling a well is is millions of dollars. First of all, so they will drill one well, and at best they know th how things are a few meters around that well. They'll drill another well, maybe a mile away or two miles away, and they know within a few meters of that, and then they extrapolate. And the other question you might ask is, okay, even if they congregate here, how would they tell me that they are there? Um, and we were told that we don't have to worry about that, so I don't. Uh, but but so the um, idea is, is, if they are magnetic particles, you can do MRI, mm -hmm. and send down something to MRI. And I, I don't know, it's not our business. This guy's frowning. You're right. I, I do MRI. Schlumberger has this thing, they put it yeah. in the back of the drill head. They do MRI. Yeah, but, but I don't know whether you can do it everywhere. The, the big problem is there's a lot, a lot of ways you can integrate these things if it is dry. Right? A lot of things get stopped by water. That's the big problem. Sorry. But they have those drills that go horizontal. Yeah, but there's a limit to all it. It's just too expensive for now. Okay. It's easy for them to give you $200,000 instead of spending several millions trying to do this. And okay, can I say? Yes. Another problem I see is that it's not actually like a pool of water. It's like a granular thing, right? Which one? This one? This yeah, part? the solution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. This, this is a cartoon. It's an absolute cartoon. <laughs> I know, but... And the, um, the, the miracle, miracle of all this is they actually gave us money based on this cartoon. But it is a cartoon. <laughs> okay. so, so, so getting them to, so to, to, to have these particles congregate at the oil water interface is trivial. Because that's what figuring motions are. So in a 
you know, you can make damaged particles till the cows come home. You can throw them in. Here's decking, you know, here's water, here's the interface. And then, you know, they, they all diffuse to the interface. This is actually quite nice. The field driven uh, defects and form very nice, nice layers. Uh, you can control the orientation of these things. Um, <coughs> Uh, for example, if you use polystyrene gold, a Janus particle, uh, polystyrene is more hydrophobic than gold. This is taken, this is water. You can see that the lighter side, which is the polystyrene side, is pointed towards the oil. If you do gold silica, silica is even more hydrophilic than gold. And then the orientation switches. So here is gold, and this is gold. This is gold silica. And here the darker side is towards the other. Um, so you can actually control your yes, only diffusion. This is pure diffusion so far. Right. So it's not self-propelled. This is just pure diffusion. So so this is so this is just to show that you can get particles congregated at the oil water interface. That's easy. And it's it's Ancient stuff. The question is, how do you move these guys? You're not pumping hydrogen peroxide anywhere. <laughs> uh, what's your fuel? Now, how do you power particles in there? So that's 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 becomes the important question. <clears throat> uh, so back to the diffusing for a equation that. I showed you. This is now power velocity. It depends on the gradient and the difference again of the cation and the anion and the zeta potential of the particle. And it turns out that in oil well, the salinity is much higher than the water they pump in. There's a big salt gradient. This is salt gradient that's external. Right? It's not that the particle is making the gradient. The previous example, silver chloride, titanium, gold, the particle was making the gradient. Here, the gradient is already there. Okay? You know, the other way of looking at it, as I tell them, is you, know, you need power to desalinize water, to separate the salt from water. So if you mix salty water with fresh water, you should be able to get power out. And that's what we can do it, right? Because this is salty, they're pumping fresh water, we should be able to power particles through this, this phenomenon. Uh, and so, so the basic idea is this uh, electrophoresis, electroosmosis mechanism where if you have a high electrolyte concentration on one side and low on the other, uh, and Let's say the particle is, is negatively charged, which typically they are. You then have a double layer that's positively charged on top of it. Uh, and we're dealing with sodium chloride, where chloride is a more mobile, higher diffusion coefficient than sodium. Uh, and so in this case, the chlorides move faster than sodium ions. Uh, and so, in this case, the fluid flow is going to be along this direction because the double layer is positively charged. It wants to go where the chlorides are. And so, the fluid flow is this way. The particle moves the other way towards higher concentration, thank God. Uh, <coughs> now, there's also the wall. And there again, the positively charged particle, sorry, positively charged double layer moves this way. Uh, so there's a net fluid flow this way. <clears throat> so the particle moves this way, then there's a net fluid flow this way. There's also chemophoresis and chemoosmosis, and that plays a less important role, but we'll talk about it. So, so to, just to demonstrate this, you can take a gel, soak it up with sodium chloride, and put it somewhere, throw in particles, and see how the particles respond. And so you, you take the gel, soak it with sodium chloride, uh, put it on a microscope slide, throw in the particles, they respond, and they all rush in. 
or the salt E, the salt is. <coughs> now, you should be surprised, right? Because this is, this is a very similar thing was in the nature materials uh, paper where the focus and defocused now uh, using salt grading. So, today all the rule in where the salt is. Uh, it's really very sensitive. We give it uh, a choice between two gels, one that was filled with one micromolar sodium chloride and one point one micromolar sodium chloride, and they go to the high one. Don't give it a choice to go to whichever has salt. But if you give it a choice, it goes to the higher one. Um, if necessary, they will go through barriers. Uh, so we put some barriers in. So the salt source is somewhere here, and this side goes through. It goes through the barriers. So, obstacle is no obstacle. Actually, it is. It turns out only these will go, these won't go. Because for them to go, they have to go backwards first, which is going in the wrong gradient direction, and they won't. But eventually, those things will fill up, and the ones that come behind them. Yeah, so, so, well, so. The thing is that if you have a stable geologic formation, everything is in equilibrium. Uh, and, and then, of course, then you're not going to see anything. It, it, it's only when you start pumping fresh water, keep, keep this gradient alive that you see this. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's, it's specific for salts. Um, so if you have uh, a gel filled with glucose versus salt, it goes to the salt, even though the glucose concentration is higher. Um, and you can measure the velocities of these things. Um, and again, you, you can ask yourself the question, you know, these are charged particles that are moving in response to a salt gradient. It's really an electric field that the salt gradient is producing, which is causing these particles to move, much like the electric field that the bipolar redox reaction was creating. So you can ask yourself the question, what is the equivalent electric field of these cases? And, and to do that, uh, you can do a similar setup where you have these particles and you apply an external electric field, uh, measure the velocity, uh, <coughs> and of course this allows you to uh, relate the uh, velocity with the electric field uh, through the zeta potential of the particles. You can get nice plots, and in that particular experiment with the gel, where you had one millimolar sodium chloride leaching out of the gel, the electric field is about 1.4 percent meter. It's a significant electric field. Um, it's not a steady electric field because eventually everything is going to equalize, but at least at the beginning, the significant. So, you know, made us happy. And so, so we went back to them the next year and said, give us more money. <laughs> so they said, well, you know, uh, the problem is there's no flow in these systems. You're pumping these things the water, right? So we have a flow. Show me that these particles will actually break out of the flow and go towards your higher salt gradient. <coughs> So, so we said, okay, we'll do that. Um, so we set up a microchannel uh, where uh, we would put in the particles from one side, the sodium chloride from the other side. Uh, we put in a flow. And uh, by the way, microns per second means nothing. You have to put them in feet per sec feet per day. Uh, but anyway, this is the <laughs> So but it turns out that this this is their flow rate. Okay, if you translate it into appropriate feet per day. Uh, so the question is this then. So you've got these so there's a flow going on this way. And the question is, is the particles going to, particles going to break out the flow and move transversely in response to the salt gradient? No? Of course, there's going to be some diffusional movement across. We know that. So the question is, is there above and beyond that diffusional movement an extra 
movement in response to the salt gradient. Um, and so what you do is you first and you tag the particles and you look at how much extra it moves transversely. Uh, and it, uh, in this particular experiment, at a distance of 100 microns from the uh, source, moves over 18 microns, uh, which translates to 12.6 microns per second. Uh, again, uh, it's, forget what, I think it's about several feet a day, which, which, is, which is actually uh, perfect. They were very happy about it. That's, for them, that's quite a bit. <coughs> Uh, so, so there is a significant movement across. Uh, and again, you can use that block of electric field, and that's what the rate, uh, the, uh, the speed is, which is about six, oh, about six volts per centimeter under those conditions. Now you might laugh at me and say these points are all here, and you've done a nice extrapolation. And this, this is this is. This is this is the worst kind of data you can have. <laughs> so we did, did a proper <laughs> physics-like calculation. Uh, and uh, instead of six, you get four volts. But <clears throat> um, again, a significant, significant uh, uh, velocity. Uh, and you can model this thing again using the net logo where you have a channel and you put in particles in this model. Uh, and you, I guess the red ones are the ones that follow that uh, the uh, gradient according to the equation I showed you. And the blue ones are insensitive to the gradients. Uh, and you put in the flow and you see the uh, diffusion uh, across. Uh, so these are the input parameters, the number density, the concentration of salt, flow rate, future coefficient, temperature, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you can do this. Uh, and in fact, you can see that the red ones clearly start to move towards the uh, salt, whereas the green ones, which are insensitive to the salt, uh, stay the way they are. Yeah. Uh, and uh, one thing you will uh, notice, and these are some of the plots, so this is, this is sodium chloride. Uh, this is some arbitrary salt where the difference in diffusion coefficient is double. Uh, this is where diffusion coefficient is the same, therefore you have no velocity towards that. At 500 microns down, it's about 10 microns across. Uh, the observation is 12.6, so it's pretty close. So the, uh, the model works works fairly well. Uh, and you can do other things like uh, you, you can calculate how changing the zeta potential of the particle uh, is going to change the rate at which they go towards the salt and so on. So, so, uh, so, so this is kind of interesting. So, we know that the uh, oil wells have this high salt content, and of course, uh, there's oil trapped in them. And you're flooding them with fresh water. And so the prediction is that you should start to see movement of particles, oil droplets, etc., out towards the fresh water. <coughs> Uh, and so this, this might be a way to recover more oil. And in case you laugh, that's a BP patent. It's called the low cell enhanced oil recovery. Their great discovery was that instead of taking water from any old source, if you put in really clean water, very rich soil content, you can up the oil recovery by 5%. 5% is millions and millions and millions of dollars. So, they call it the low cell process of being Google it. <laughs> uh, what else is there that can cause flow in reservoirs? Well, reservoirs are rock, rock walls, right? The most common mineral in the rock wall is calcium carbonate, limestone. 
And limestone has, you know, it's very slightly soluble in water. That's the solubility product at minus nine. But nevertheless, it does have some solubility. And if you look at what ions are formed, you notice that um, one of them moves a lot faster than the other ones. So what that means is that just a piece of limestone put in water should not cause movement. Because ions are coming out, the anion is moving faster than the cation, and the particles should respond. Trace of particles should respond. Um, so you can take a piece of calcium carbonate, in this case, what? Well, three micron, and if you put trace of particles, these are negatively charged, sulfate and polystyrene, trace of particles, put on a glass substrate, <coughs> um, and see what happens. Okay? I mean, this is so stupidly simple, it's unbelievable. Um, so first of all, they're collecting every calcium carbonate, and then start pumping out the particles. So, they put, so what hap what's happening is particles are coming down and they're being pumped out. Okay? And just to make the oil people happy, uh, they will do that to oil droplets too. So the oil droplets are being pulled in from the surface and being pushed out. <laughs> now, uh, one thing you would have noticed is that the trace of particles are negatively charged. Right? And I said that the anion moves faster than the cation. So you would expect the trace of particles to move towards the calcium carbonate because the electric field is pointed out. But they're moving out. So what is happening here? And what's happening here is this. Now it turns out that when we're doing this experiment, of course we're sitting on a glass slide, and uh, in calcium carbonate, the glass slide has a more negative zeta potential than the tracer particles. And so the electroosmotic flow dominates, and that's why the particles move up. Uh, <clears throat> But if you add other kinds of salts where this thing reverses, so if you add some uh, uh, potassium chloride, uh, you can switch it now. Um, so here, when you have just calcium carbonate present, the uh, tracer particles were less negatively charged in silica. Now it's the other way around. Um, so here, um, if you just have calcium carbonate, they're pushed out. Uh, but if you now add some uh, but in this case, potassium nitrate is start to move in. <clears throat> so you can actually control the uh, direction uh, of movement of these things. So even rock walls will pump. Okay, you don't need pumps to pump water. Rock walls will do it. Okay, uh, so a large piece of rocks will do this. No sweat. Put some zeta potential in the particle on the surface. You can have. Either electrophoresis or electroosmosis dominate, uh, and you can have complex fluid pattern. So that was the end of the second year. So, so he said, give us more money. <laughs> yeah. And they said, well, you haven't actually used the real rocks. Who? Show me that you can stick these particles into them. So I said, OK, fine. <laughs> So, so we got them to make us some slices. <coughs> um, so this is your rock, and it's on a glass, and it's, it's, it's stuck to a glass slide. Um, and what we're doing is, is on top, we put some this water in which we have quantum dots, which floats. And then we invert the whole thing. So. Remember, this is, the, this is the glass slide, the rock is here, and then there's water with quantum dots in it. And we're looking at it by confocal microscope. Okay. <clears throat> and so we do two things. One is you pre-soak the rock with salt, 
then dry it out and wash out the surface so that there's some salt inside. And so now, if any water goes in, you create a salt gradient. And the particle should move in as a response. Versus another sample where you do not pre-soak it in salt and see what happens. <clears throat> All right, so if you, if you um, let's see this. So this is pre oh, this got cut off. But this is where you do not pre-soak it in salt. Uh, so you're looking at the rock as you, this distance means higher the distance, more into the rock you are. Uh, and there's no penetration of the particle into the rock. But here you start to see that the particles are beginning to penetrate uh, into the rock. Uh, and you can do a time lapse and you can see, so this is the depth going into the rock. And you can see that in time, more and more and more of the particles are going in and further and further into the rock. It's kind of interesting because it's a, it's a tube essentially with one end closed, because one end is a glass slide. So if you had a tube with one opening on one side and nothing on the other side, mm -hmm. is it, do you know any other way you could put a particle in? I don't know, maybe. So now we have the particle in there. Can we pull them out? Uh, the answer is yes. All you have to do is now, instead of having fresh water outside, put in salt water outside. Now you reverse the gradient. And they start to come out. And so here is a tube which is closed on one end. You can shove particles in, you can pull them out. These are 20 nanometer quantum dots. The, uh, the pore diameter is about a micron or so. Uh, so anyway, they had a meeting, and I think they're going to get the money for the third year. So, um, in clearly generate significant electric fields due, due to uh, uh, ion gradients, uh, um, the salt concentration, the reservoirs, also because of ions leaching from rock surfaces. Uh, and this creates active fluid flow, you know, sorry, microns, not moving. Uh, microns per second through the reservoir. Uh, uh, and also, uh, particle movement, uh, so both uh, diffuse the osmosis and diffuse the phoresis. Uh, the velocity is independent of particle size because in the low Reynolds number regime, uh, but the velocity of course depends on the zeta potentials, so I keep hammering this into them. This is from the, the talk I gave them because they haven't thought about zeta potentials too much. Um, and, and this is really the only way to move things. I mean, if you're pumping water and you think pressure-driven flow is going to give you the oil, forget it. Because in narrow channels, pressure-driven flows do not work. <coughs> in a pressure-driven flow, your wall is the impediment. That's where the friction is coming from. Right? In our case, the wall is the pump. That's what's causing the fluid flow. So we have inverted the whole concept uh, in that sense. Uh, and plus, of course, if you, if, if you have a channel that's blocked at one side, as I showed you, this is the only way to get things in and out anyway. Uh, so plug flow is, is diffusive for any pumping is much better than pressure driven flows uh, from these things. Okay. That's what I'm on. So your equations actually have a lot of money attached to them. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes? So, so what remains to be done for this uh, to actually be used in the oil? Like keep asking me these things. And I say, well, there's fundamental studies to be done. And we can go on for years and years and years like for a couple of hundred thousand a year. <laughs> 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 but it seems like you have solved it. 
it seems like it should work, right? I mean, no, what are the challenges? No, because, no, the point is, what we haven't, what we haven't done is, is, you know, go into the field and show this, this, this actually works, and, and so on, and, you know, long enough, you know, scale, and, and, and so on, and so forth. And, and that, that's part of the thing that, that needs to be done. But the other thing is, do you understand, I certainly don't, but, um, things like these. I, you know, these. The reason, I, I just don't understand these trends. I mean, there are all kinds of weird ion effects going on. And the reservoirs are incredibly complex things. Not that you're really interested in it, but I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but uh, we really want to understand the fundamentals of these things. I mean, there's a lot of things that you need to understand. And okay, can I like summarize very quickly for just to see yeah. if I understood right? So, so what you have is um, so there's oil somewhere, but we don't know where. And then there's a somewhere we make a hole, and we there's we put water in. Yeah. That is low and so. So, so, so for example, let me give you one example of the way they try to recover oil. Uh, with the water they put in surfactant because this these oil is the oil is caught in these channels. With the water, they put in surfactant and hoping that that will lower the surface tension and pull the oil up. If you're pumping water, the surfactant goes in the water, comes out at the other end. You've wasted most of this effect, almost all of it. Okay. If you could have a part that would break out of that flow, move to the oil water interface, deliver the surfactant there, you can get away with much less surfactant. We haven't done that. All we have shown is you can move these things through salt solutions. So that's that's one example. The other is just tell me where the interface is, and that's I think much more difficult because I don't know. You, you scoff at MRI, I scoff at it too. I, I don't understand how you do it, but maybe they can do it. But those are some of the problems. So in, in, in a way, it's it's more difficult than even biological systems. At least you can put a human being into an MRI machine. <laughs> yes. Um, going back to the microbox and chemotaxis through a chemical gradient. Yeah. Um, naively, without even doing any type of calculation, I would think that since it's only sampling at one spot in the gradient, yeah, you get some moving fast on one side, some moving slow on another side, but it all be pretty much even. So thinking about biology, you mentioned that bacteria have a memory. Yeah. But the way I, I could be wrong, but the way I understood chemotaxis through bacteria is that one end senses the chemical gradient on one side, the other end senses the chemical gradient on the other side, the chemical concentration. So if you made a rod that had platinum gold insulator or gold platinum. So before you go on, so yeah, so the mechanism you suggested does not require temporal memory. But the argument against that is the bacteria is small enough that the gradient across the body of the bacteria okay. is too small to sample. <clears throat> so, so you would be able to make That's the argument. Okay. I'm, I'm just giving you the party lines here. <clears throat> um, I'll show, as I'll show tomorrow, we, we actually can move particles in a chemical gradient. The, the effect is small, but it's there. Uh, but I want to understand why they move the way they do. And that's what, but I didn't want to tell you the uh, answer. I want you to do the calculation first and then tell me why they move the way they do. Another question. Okay, thank you.